Dr. Jacob Torres, as a, as a kidney scientist, I mean, you study kidneys and their function and, and kidney disease pretty much all day, every day. <laughs> who's, who's the kind of person that really should be limiting protein consumption? Uh, so from my research and experience, the, the main individuals are late stage chronic kidney disease uh, in people. That, so they might have a um, stage four, which is the, you know, the farthest progression, and stage 3B. I think those are the ones where you start to see protein in the urine. Those are like the, the, the individuals that are starting to get to the issue with filtration specifically. And so you can have all these uh, um, problems with getting rid of excess ammonia or urea. And that's when things start to get iffy about overproducing those, um, those, you know, those um, nitrogen compounds. So where did all of this stuff come from with regards to like, you should limit your protein intake for kidney health or better yet, just for regular people? If you consume too much protein, it's bad for your kidneys. Like, A, where did that come from? B, how does that actually work? What does that actually look like? Mm -hmm. What does protein really do when it comes down to the kidneys? And uh, what would maybe the tolerable upper amount generally be? I put a link down below for 30% off all things from Thrive Market on your first order. Now, they're not just about snacks and pantry staples. They've got good, legit, high protein foods, which is how I live. Even my snacks are high protein. Thing is, if you go to a grocery store, the high protein snacks, they're, they're kind of playing games with you. Like they'll call it high protein, but you look at the ingredients and you realize that there's like some weird kind of like pea protein or something. Not that there's anything wrong with pea protein, but the reality is it's not what it seems on the surface. And it might only be four grams of protein. The thing I like about Thrive is you see what you get and you get what you see. It's transparent. So you can look at the ingredients and they're not gonna have garbage there and you're gonna be able to see it. And then it gets delivered right to your doorstep. So you're not having to spend time. Even myself, I know what to look for at a grocery store, but it takes me probably 25% longer to go grocery shopping than the average person because I do cross-reference everything that's in the ingredients. I don't like to bring that stuff into my house. Thrive Market takes that guesswork out of the equation for me, and it makes it accessible to me, but it makes it accessible to people all over the country. So that's what's really cool. So that link gets you 30% off your entire first grocery order and gets you a free $60 gift. Not to mention it gets delivered right to your doorstep, which is pretty darn cool. And their shipping is speedy, speedy fast. So that link down below. All right. So I wish I could give you the full history, but I know a few of the, the, the details about where this comes from. So you eat protein. Protein makes ammonia, uh, the, has nitrogen in it. So the nitrogen makes, ends up as urea. And then you can also make ammonia from, from that. Over acidification of, is, a, is an issue. So if you eat a lot of protein, one of the issues is that you might make a lot of ammonia and then that'll end up um, causing the um, acidification of the urine. So the, the kidney being acidified is a problem. Like that's that kind of established that um, over acidification causes all sorts of problems in function. And it's why like supplementing with things like bicarbonate is good because you kind of raise the, the pH of the, the urine and the kidney function. So that seems to be good because the optimal pH is, you know, 7.2 between 6.8 and 7.2. It seems to be really good for kidneys. So 7.2 even seems better. Like mitochondria work better. Um, everything just seems to, to have a higher flow rate. But if you acidify, you start to decrease all of the, the metabolic machinery. It starts to not work as well as it gets over acidified. So protein is associated with that, that function, that, uh, that issue, right? So you eat a lot of protein, you get a lot of acidification. So that's, that's a big part of it. Um, so that's the, I think uh, one of the stories, the other one is that, um, protein shows up in the urine of late stage, um, kidney disease. So if you have proteinuria, that's like means that the the cells that are responsible for preventing the, like they're filtering out the, the urine, they're no longer attached properly. So protein starts to make its way from the blood into the urine and then it just shows up as in, in the, it shows up on a test and they're saying, okay, well now that you're showing deterioration of kidney function, you're no, no longer filtering properly. And so then I think that that alone, people hear protein yeah. and then protein, you know, gets associated, it's just yeah. dietary reverse, protein. Reverse causation. And, yeah, yeah, is associated with that. But really what you're seeing is albumin, um, which is just like the major blood component protein that's just showing up in the urine. 
I don't, it's not like a direct correlation between the food, the protein you eat and the albumin in your blood. They're not related in that way. It's just that it, I think they have the same, they both say protein, just like fat is bad because fat has the word fat in it. Yeah. It's just like one of those types of things. Yeah. It's like eating fat doesn't necessarily mm-hmm. mean that you have high VLDL. Or that, yeah, it would make you fat necessarily. So yeah. this, we have this, just this naming convention that I think that also is confusing. And then there was some research that was, I think, one study in the 70s, I always forget this part of the story, but it's there was one research that indicated that maybe the protein intake was bad for kidneys, um, but then that was like not very well done. And then it, it kind of just stayed as dogma throughout time. And as data has been, you know, grown and grown, it's fine that protein intake does not seem to deteriorate kidney function um, if it's like at normal amounts. So, you know, 20, 25% protein intake is like normal. Like that's just like a normal protein intake does not seem to lead to, um, kidney function loss. There have been some studies where they've looked at very high protein intakes and it seems like there's a, there's another effect called hyperfiltration that occurs. So if you eat a, a bolus of protein, you get this, uh, um, this constriction of the arterioles around the, um, the glomerulus. So it's like this, the blood supply that feeds the filtering unit of the kidney. And that is related to the amount of protein that's just, di- just had just been eaten. So if you eat a big bolus of protein, it actually causes constriction and then increases the filtration rate. So you get this thing called hyperfiltration. But that, that is, that's like the thing that people worry about. They worry about this effect primarily when they talk about the excess protein. So if you, if you eat some protein, it, the hyperfiltration occurs transiently. That's normal. Like you get this transient hyperfiltration. It's not the same as the hyperfiltration that occurs when you have, like, say, a um, high blood pressure or some other, uh, you know, vascular disease that occurs where it causes constriction or some other, um, like, a high, like, just from high blood pressure alone can cause this hyperfiltration effect. That's one of the signs of late stage kidney disease is that you get hyperfiltration. So they're associating the acute protein response for hyperfiltration with the chronic kidney disease hyperfiltration symptom. And so then that's the other portion of the story that causes protein to be demonized for kidneys. So you kind of end up with these like these all these little stories that come together and they make kid, you know protein be bad for kidneys. So what would a tolerable or I just shouldn't say tolerable, but I mean what do you see at least in the literature as being the amount where this hyperfiltration even starts, like, is it a pretty significant bolus of protein that you'd have to take in? Yeah, I think if you if you do like a, I mean, if you eat a chicken breast, I think you would experience some form of hyperfiltration. Yeah, throw, out, throw out all the chicken breasts. <laughs> I think just like a 30 gram, 40 grams of protein would be enough to cause a, like an elevation of just this just that, but again, it's transient. Yeah. It occurs for just the period of time that amino acids are elevated in the blood that dirt following that, that bolus. And then you, it kind of goes back to its normal amount. So it's not like a lot required. Um, but again, it, it seems like it's a normal function of, of the biology of the kidney that it just responds in that way. So, and that's, that's even in that, that acute kind of time frame that's not particularly stressful on the kidney from what you see? I don't think so. I mean, it, it seems to be normal. I, I would not know if you, if they call it stressful, but I think the concern is that repeatedly activating that hyperfiltration mm. response might put stress on the kidneys. Yeah. Yeah. So you're emulating what happens in a late stage kidney yeah. disease. Right. But it's sort of like. I don't know if you, did you ever see that study on like erythritol a while back, like that where they're saying like erythritol causes heart disease and things like that. Yeah. It's like complete reverse causation. It's mm-hmm. like just because erythritol is elevated in people that have like yes. heart disease doesn't mean that elevating blood levels of erythritol via your diet acutely caused it. cause heart disease. Right? right. So it's the same kind of discussion. It's like, okay, yes, you have late stage kidney disease and you have this mm-hmm. hyperfiltration and this increased blood pressure. That's an entirely different situation than what's happening here. It's just, right. but it's. I could see how it'd be easy for someone to connect. You can make dots. the. You can make the jump. Yeah, the jump is not that hard to. You know, you can say, yeah, it's, it's this thing looks like this thing, so maybe they're the same. And and then the overabundance of caution comes in, right? Where you're just like, let's not, let's not figure this one out. Well, well then, <laughs> then, it, then it gets really funny because then it starts turning into a demonization of animal protein, mm-hmm. like specifically when in reality. 
protein is going to be protein at that rate, right? Like well, there's, um, <coughs> I can't remember the top of my head, the amino acid that is responsible for this effect, um, but it is more abundant in animal protein. So they've done the studies worth looking at like soy protein versus whey protein to see, and I think egg has been compared. So they look at different protein sources to see if it affects the filtration response and animal protein does have more of an effect. Okay, so it's just taking that same- Because the amino acid of, composition is different. Yeah, so you're just taking that same argument and just pushing it a little further because it's exacerbating that same hyperfiltration. Right. But it doesn't actually cause any more of a problem per se. Yeah, well, it's, it, it, it <clears throat> seems unlikely. And I think that the long-term studies have shown that people with um, that eat moderate protein don't accelerate kidney disease. And this has even been done in um, PKD. So. There's been studies that because they were interested in knowing does it does it accelerate the disease progression and in, in polycystic kidney disease and it does not it looks like protein was independent of the progression so the people that had normal protein consumption throughout the they were not restricting they still progressed the same as anybody else did and they compared it to restricting protein and it didn't do the restricted actually. They didn't, it didn't matter and they probably had, they were worse off because they're going to be losing muscle mass during that period of time that they're restricting it. Is there any kind of, you know, feedback that you're aware of in terms of like metabolic health? Let's say someone that, what I'm trying to look at is if someone eats adequate amount of protein as they're aging and they maintain adequate muscle mass and consequently adequate metabolic health as a result of having a glucose sink and sort of just that extra metabolic health. Is there a link between better metabolic health and better kidney function? Like, or do they operate really independently? Mm. Uh, yeah, I, would, <laughs> I assume so. Cause I just, from what I know about the kidneys, they seem to be, you know, very responsive to excess glucose, like glu like over too much glucose seems to be really bad for the kidney. It causes all sorts of, all sorts of problems. So having a yeah, glucose sink is really important is, you get older, like, you know, if your muscle mass starts to decrease, you're just losing a disposal, right? Like there's nowhere for all that glu extra glucose to go. So it ends up glycating things. So that's like, I think we talked about this before about the, the glycation of mm -hmm. proteins that causes a lot of problems in the kidneys. That's a, that isn't one of the big issues of as over time, like excess glucose causes the glycation and then insulin resistance is another big problem for the kidneys. So let's clear up the, the glycation piece really piece really quick though. Cause I feel like that's, that gets confusing. And I know we've talked about in another video, but like the excess protein isn't causing the glycation mm -hmm. of the proteins. Cause people get confused with that. They're like, Oh, well, should I should limit my protein because the protein's going to mm -hmm. get glycated. The, no, just, maybe just explain that real quick. So, so the glycation is occurring <laughs> on like cellular proteins. So like you might have, you might have receptors or, um, proteins that are sticking out into the, and in, you know, they're interacting with the blood or interacting with like the filtrate of in the next example, the, the, the kidney, um, nephron. And if you have high glucose, you can have things attaching to those extracellular receptors and it can change their function because they're, they're already have glycations on them, like that were put there by the cell, the cell makes every protein that is expressed on the outside of a cell has glycations on it. And so if you have a lot, and there's specific patterning, so the pattern is very specific to that cell and what it's doing, and it did it purposefully. And if you have these high glucose levels, you can have the non-enzymatic addition of these molecules onto those proteins, and it can actually change like mm -hmm. the code that's on those proteins to maybe say that they're not self any longer, or that they, they no longer dock to the proper proteins they're supposed to bind to. So that's the glycation that we're concerned with. And you can also have that occur on proteins intracellularly or on different sides of the, you know, like on the basement membrane as well, of the cell. Okay, yeah, so it's not, consuming carbohydrates with protein causing glycation in the no, no it's i've not heard that one. <laughs> oh, you hear it all in the comment section okay <laughs> yeah it's you're you're around people that are in in the lab and probably you know have a basic understanding of that it's usually either people that have been misled or trolls that okay. just want to yeah i've not heard that one before but yeah so it's not going to be the stuff that you're eating it's going to i don't think there's a sufficient time for that glycation to occur there. I mean, it could be stuff that you're eating when it comes down to, you know, insulin resistance and, and glucose spikes, but there could be like malleard yeah. reaction. Is that what they're referencing to? Like, Probably. Cause like malleard reaction, you know, you're cooking, caramelizing you're, you're caramelizing it. Yes, exactly. Then you could have some in non enzymatic addition. You have all sorts of things being produced there, but if you're cooking like in a sugar sauce, 
you're putting your you're putting your your meat with sugar and then you cook it you're causing a reaction and then yes you could glycate those those proteins that way that could change their that could do something but the 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 blood the blood levels of glucose would cause the glycation in the body i think that's a probably more relevant the stuff that you're doing as you're eating it yeah you're going to change the how those proteins look and there's all sorts of other issues with that because that binds to um inflammatory receptors as well and the and the glycation advanced glycation in, in products i mean that could directly have an impact on the kidneys right yes so it's it's kind of funny when you take this full circle it's like okay protein is probably not problematic it's probably much more so the stuff that like yeah, the refined carbs and the thing. Oh, yeah, the refined carbs. <laughs> well, surprise. <laughs> yeah. This is, and I think maybe people get confused thinking that excess protein is going to contribute to higher levels of glucose, which is not quite how it works so directly. I mm -hmm. mean, it's obviously a different pathway yeah. altogether. Well, the gluconeogenesis <laughs> stuff, people are worried that you're going to have. I think one thing I've heard is that it turns into fat. I've heard that one too, that the path from that you can have protein, you eat too much protein, it gets turned into carbohydrate from gluconeogenesis, and then that can then turn into fat. Yep. I think that that's not, I mean, I, from the studies I've seen, it seems like you're getting, so gluconeogenesis is like 15% effective like of the amount yeah. of turning protein into it's very inefficient yeah, yeah it's a very inefficient mm -hmm. process and then you ha we're talking about another process like so you got that the amount of carbohydrate has to survive and then make its way to the liver to be a sterified or has to be lengthened first and then a sterified so it's a, a very unlikely pathway and a very inefficient one so it's not impossible but just seems non-appreciable like it's such a small amount yeah. that would that would it could occur. It seems unlikely that that's ever going to be an issue. Very much so demand driven versus just a supply thing. It's not like you're eating a bunch yeah. of protein. Even in a ketogenic state, you're not just magically. I mean, you're much more likely to take a triglyceride <clears throat> glycerol backbone and turn that into it. Well, that's going to say too. You're not even like yeah. It's hard to <clears throat> your glycerol is your main choke point in in a ketogenic diet because you just you're using up all the glycerol you're making. Like it's just going to get turned into glucose. I think for them, like it's you got to find the the glucose somewhere, right? So it's like the backbones are the easiest place to to get it from. Is it, and using glycerol to turn to glucose makes a lot of sense. From from what I've heard before, it's <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> from what I've heard before, it's more about kind of how the why am I losing my voice? More about how the protein essentially backburners some of the other substrates so mm -hmm. maybe those other substrates can get stored as fat a little bit easier but it's not actually the protein and even then it has to be a lot and you have to be in a caloric surplus at that point for that to really right. take an effect yeah you're not going to you're not re-esterifying uh fats unless there's a surplus yeah yeah that's that's true as well all right, Dr. Jacob Torres, where can everyone find you, my man? Uh, Since find I'm me. losing my voice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, DrJacobTorres.com is the easiest way to find me. Right on, my man. All right, man, thanks. Cool.